It all started with a photograph. It was taken 35 years ago by a team of geologists mapping near Chignik Bay, Alaska. Other paleontologists had tried to get to this site, but it wasn't until this year that it finally happened. We had four days to find a set of dinosaur footprints in an area three times the size of our campus, and that's if they hadn't already eroded away. I'm Pat Druckenmiller, Earth Science Curator at the University of Alaska Museum. And I'm Kevin May, uh, Operations Manager at the University of Alaska Museum. We're pretty excited about the opportunity to travel down to southwest Alaska on the Alaska Peninsula to locate a set of trackways of a dinosaur that were, were discovered initially in, uh, 35 years ago by oil geologists working in the area we're back to sort of relocate those tracks to see if we can then uh, fully document the site, find out exactly how old those rocks are and when those dinosaurs lived, and a little bit about what kind of dinosaurs actually made the tracks. The team included Kevin May from our museum, geologists Sarah Fole and Paul McCarthy from the UAF, and invertebrate paleontologist Robert Blodgett from Anchorage. Everyone we met in Chignik Bay was really helpful about uh, helping us get prepared to, to head out in the field and do our work. Today is June 19th and we're gearing up to fly out to our site from Chignik Bay. And uh, we're just waiting for our helicopter to arrive. We did spend a lot of time waiting around for weather and for aircraft which is a part of field work in Alaska. That's something we've come to expect uh, working everywhere from the North Slope down to the southern part of the state. And when you're waiting around for with nothing better to do, well, there's lots of cool things to check out. And so we spent time walking around the beach, uh, checking out the, the local invertebrate fauna, and various crabs, uh, wrecked, wrecked trawlers, and all sorts of interesting things. We even spent a little bit of time looking in the beach in that area for dinosaur tracks as well, which are likely to be present in the rocks right around town. Ahead of everything else, we had to have eight drums of fuel shipped out. There's no gas station out there. Yeah, that was, that was a new thing for me as well, to find out that uh, we had to get the helicopter fuel to Chignik Bay. And that was a real, another one of the many logistical challenges to this trip. One of the, the integral parts of this whole process, of course, was getting helicopter support. And Sam Egley from Egley Air Hall and King Salmon was uh, a huge, huge help here. Uh, Sam flew his uh, helicopter down from King Salmon to Chignik Bay, which is two and a half hours of airtime alone, just to reach us at the rendezvous. He then spent uh, a chunk of the day shuttling us from Chignik Bay into our field site, which was quite a, quite a process in its own right, finding a safe landing spot and actually relocating the track site. This was a really uh, culminating moment of the whole project, really, because after literally uh, more than a year, actually, of planning and, and preparing for this trip, we're finally off the ground off to uh, locate the site in the field and uh, I was I was mixed of sort of a mixed feeling of, of excitement yet kind of nervous because uh, it was entirely possible at this point that that we might not even be able to relocate the site or even if we found the general area uh, the site the track site itself may actually had already eroded away for all we know. Yeah we've been looking at photos of this site for a good 15 or more years it was really neat to finally actually see the ground instead of just a bunch of topographic lines on a map. You actually see the landscape and it was, it was gorgeous, beautiful landscape. We were told to expect a lot of bear activity at the site. 
and uh, we saw a lot of bear activity at the site. Uh, we saw, I think, five bears within the first two hours of us landing it and setting up our camp. But we had a lot of different precautions, and everything went just fine, and we had no problems. They were interested in the fish. They were uh, fish were running up the rivers, so they were they were occupied. We were concerned with our dinosaur tracks, and everyone was happy. Well, the day we got there, the weather was beautiful. That was a great first day. Yeah, first day and the last day were good. In between, not so good. Not good. <laughs> it was a pretty challenging daily commute to the site, but it was worth it. Each day we hiked from our camp about a mile, mile and a half up the steep canyon. Pretty challenging commute. Uh, it took us about an hour and a half just to walk that, that short distance to then get to the track site. Well, today is June 20th. What time is it, guys? One o'clock. It's one o'clock, June 20th, and we have arrived at our destination that we've been heading towards since Thursday the 17th. Uh, we have located the site uh, first uh, documented in 1975, and uh, we're about to start uh, doing what we came here to do. Yeah? Okay. We didn't know, we didn't know which, how far up the canyon. We didn't know if they were going to be on the left side or the right side of the canyon. And as we kept working our way up, we just were looking and looking and looking and voila, there they were. We turned around and they were actually facing us as we looked back down the canyon. And it was a really nice feeling to finally see these things. So we, we came all this way. We finally found the tracks. We were very excited, but we couldn't actually get to them. They were perched about 20 feet above our head. And the only way we were going to be able to access the site was using some climbing gear. These dinosaur tracks were originally made on a, on a flat, a horizontal surface as footprints made into sand. And that rock, that sandstone later became rock, and that rock then became tilted and uh, almost vertically and uplifted during mountain building events that happened millions of years later. Fortunately, we brought along climbing Back gear. Back to logistics and contingency. And this was a contingency plan that we had brought along climbing gear in order to access the site if necessary. And in fact, it saved our bacon. And what are you doing in that bucket? Sill putty. Tell me about sill putty. It's half of the magic that makes molds of tracks. It's sort of like... Silly putty. Silly putty. Except if you mix it with the magical other half, it sets and holds its form. <laughs> Sill putty, it's a two-part molding compound that you mix together 50-50. Mix it together, squeeze it on, push it right into the print surface itself, and then you can make a perfect, a perfect copy of the track. Southwest Alaska showing its its true colors, wind, rain. We, uh, we made sure that we went out into the field with extra food and all the right gear. But this is not the sort of place you want to get caught without, uh, without being well prepared. Anyway, we got a good set on our uh, still putty peels. We've got the first one off. Here. We put the sill putty on the first day when the weather was great. When we came back the next day to take the, the molds off, the weather had definitely turned south and it was wet and rainy and not very pleasant. But uh, the sill putty held up really well and we were able to still remove the, the, the molds and to uh, safely take them off the face. 